chapter 4. We're going to look at the first six verses. And I'm going to start by reading that passage together. I have the New International Version that I'm reading from. You may have another version, but it's all good, the same message. And I want to read these encouraging words written by a guy by the name of Paul. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord, literally on house arrest, this servant of the Lord named Paul, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body. Let's see how many times you count one. One body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith. I've run out of fingers. One baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Last week, uh, we talked about this five-fold understanding of maybe the declarations, this 268 declaration that would identify a group of people that are passionate about the Lord. I would like to think that Christ Community Church, a group of people, would have that same 268 declaration that we are passionate for the Lord and that we want to serve Him, love Him, do everything we can to acknowledge Him. And we said last week that the first declaration of the five was that we would have a passion to know God above all things. That our desire to know Him would be identified in our passionate pursuit in this life. God, give me the desire to know you more. The second declaration, which I'm not touching on today because I think we've already talked about it with this idea of partnership, is stated like this. Love for the local expression of his church. It says, because Christ established the church for God's glory, I will invest the gifts he has given me in the, in the life and mission of my local church. So that if you are part of this church, Christ Community Church, then you are saying, I will love the church and I will invest in the church. I will love the church, and I will invest the church. My first declaration is I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him. I want to know Christ deeply, intimately. And I want to love his church because he's the head of the church. And we have to serve the church according to the gifts that we're given. And so we're not going to go into all of the gifts that you would have you know, in your own wheelhouse, that your own toolbox that God has planted there by his spirit for you to use for his glory. But we would say that you have gifts to use. And the quick message is use them. Because we are living in koinonia, this partnership with one another. As we move forward together in this mission, we have no other recourse but to use those gifts well. One body, many parts. And every part is important. Think of your own body. Is there any part that really you would just say, oh, I think I can get rid of that and that's okay? Of course not. You would say every part has a function, right? Yeah. And so let's function well. That's not the message. Although, let me just say, together, built on Christ the cornerstone, we become a holy temple in the Lord in which God lives by his spirit. He lives here in the local church. God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine by his power and through his church. And so we need to be reminded that Christ loves the church and so should we. But today, the third declaration is this, and it's about unity. The word of the day is unity, unity, unity. And you'll heard, you've heard already in the scripture that number one come up repeatedly. Unity among believers that amplifies his name, that makes it more pronounced and louder than it could ever be in our own frame or work on our own. Because God's fame is amplified when believers love one another. I will strive for unity amongst all Christians in my region, whether that's in my campus, in this area with local churches, whether that's in my own home with other believers. Give me a desire to lift up your name above every other name. So Paul writes uh, these words to us. He writes these words to us in reference to the same scriptures that were written that would remind us what Jesus has for us. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new command I give you. Do you remember what that was? A new command to? Love one another. 
And he goes on and he says, love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. So we have a model for that love. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So you are to model his love so that people will know that you are representatives of his. That you are ambassadors for Christ. John 17, when Jesus is praying, he's praying for all believers that they may be one. Brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you have sent me and that you love them. Do you understand that when we live in unity with one another, as believers, when we live in that unity that we're created for, then he is made known in the world. Wait a second, isn't it me just declaring the word? Isn't it just me testifying or evangelizing? No, it's saying that when we live unified, that's the testimony. Let's live unified lives. Psalm 34 verse 3 says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name, what? Together. Not in isolation. We do this together. That's why we sang these songs together. That's why when the worship team is up here on different Sundays, we worship together. And we worship together in this local body. There are churches all around this region in their local bodies. They're doing the same thing, but we're doing one thing, lifting up the name of Jesus. Because he's worthy. And Psalm 133 verse 1 says how pleasant and good it is when God's people live together in unity. So today, Paul is going to remind us here in chapter 4 that we have a job to do. And it's a good job. And he's reminding us from the first three chapters of the reason that we have a job and why it's so good to do. The first three chapters that Paul writes is a reminder for us he says, remember these things, everything that God has done for us. Can I just briefly remind you so that we don't have to go through and read every chapter of some of the highlights of things that God has done for us? In chapter 1, it says that every spiritual blessing is in Christ. That we are now holy and blameless in his sight. That we have been adopted as his children. That we have been redeemed from the pit to brought back to life. That he bought us out of that slavery and into freedom. He has forgiven us. He has lavished grace on us. He has given us the knowledge of the mystery of his will in a way that we can never understand without the Holy Spirit living within us. He has chosen us. He has given us purpose. That's chapter 1. And then he goes on in chapters 2 and 3. You are now made alive in Christ. You are saved through faith. You have a hopeful outlook. You are now living a peaceful life, united with other believers. You are heirs to a promise, a promise that you now share as members of one body. That you are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit, rooted and established in love, aware that God can do immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine. And he now says in the very first verse of chapter 4, as a prisoner for the Lord then, because not only am I in chains, but now you are bound. If you are called to be in the same position that I am, not physically in house arrest, but you are bound in your heart to the Lord because of what he's done for you. I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to do the very thing that I'm calling you to do because this is what he's called us to, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Which means you have received something. I want you to think of that idea of worthiness as a scale. Have you ever seen those scales? They have like a balance on this side and a balance on this side and there's a, uh, something connecting the two. And then you put something of any weight on one side with nothing on the other and it goes like this. What? Ding. Right? And he said, you just think of all the things, all the worthy things that God has done that he's listed in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and we are like, <laughs> You ever see a seesaw with a relatively large person on one side <laughs> and a relatively light person on the other side? Sometimes you just wish they catapulted, right? You know, you, you do wish this sometimes, but it's just for fun. But the fact is, you see this, right? And we're the light. I live this out every day, but we're the light people, and it goes like this. And now he says, you are to live lives that are worthy, that weigh, that weigh out, that balance out the calling that you've received. In some way, these scales need to be then evened. And you're going, that is absolutely impossible. No matter if you jumped on it, no matter how much change you put in your pocket, no matter how many people you got to jump on that side with you, there's no way that on your own you can tip the scales to a place of balance. And yet that's the calling. No intimidation. I urge you, 
to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. What you've received needs to be balanced with your life. Now, let's just think logically here. Is there any way in our own strength that we could ever do this on our own? No, there's none. There's no work that we could ever do. There's no effort we could ever do. There's nothing we could ever create that is ever going to make it worthy, make it balanced, and yet it is Christ in us that balances the scale. If Christ is on one side, what's going to balance the other side? Christ. So as we live the life that is worthy of the calling that we've received, that balance takes place. This is what he's done for us. And this is what our life needs to look like in return. And we go, well, how do I do that? How do I live a life worthy of the calling? You see, our, to live a life worthy of the calling is to live the life of Christ. It's to live the life, the life of Christ. What is Christ? The light of the world. So we are to live a life that is out of darkness and into the light. That we are not to live in darkness anymore. That we're not to settle for anything of the darkness anymore. That we are to pursue the light, and the only light that is worthy of shining is the light of Christ in us and through us. It says later in this chapter, or this book, I should say, it says to walk worthy of the calling, but it also says walk or live in the way of love. In chapter 5, verse 8, it says walk or live as children of light. And later in the same chapter, it says be careful how you walk or live, not as unwise, but as wise. Not in the dark, but in the light. And so for what he's going to tell us, we have to put this into perspective that what he is about to call us to do is going to in some way miraculously change this tipping of the scale to a place of balance. Our life is all about balancing the scale. Not because the balancing of the scale earns us a favor that puts us into a place of, oh, God will now accept me. It puts us into a place of living a life that is worthy of the calling that has already been placed in our life. It's about representing well, being his ambassadors. Well, what seems like an impossible task becomes quite clear, but almost too simple. Because here's, the, here's what he says to do. This is what you need to do to balance the scale. Be completely humble. And if you stop and you just go by that really quickly, right? You just read your Bible and you read by that really quickly. You go, oh, that's easy. And then you start thinking about that, and you think about how nearly impossible that is to live humble lives. What's the next one? Be gentle. And I know some of you are very gentle, naturally people. You're not really argumentative or looking to get into a battle. with. But honestly, in some of our spirits, there is this battling spirit that doesn't balance that idea of gentleness. The third one, get ready, be patient. Be patient. Yeah, no explanation needed. And four, bearing with one another in love. Those, that's what you do to balance the scale. Now, is that all you do? But I, I, I don't necessarily think so. But yeah, I think that this is a great representation for us of what it is that we must do to, 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 to live a life that's worthy of the calling. Humbled, humble living, gentleness, patience, and love by keeping the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's the calling that you have received. This idea of unity. Unity is catalyzed by our spiritual and theological oneness. When we can understand that we are one, that we can live this life of unity, that we can be humble before one another, that we can be gentle with one another, we can be patient with one another, that we can love one another even in the times of burden. This shows the unity that God is saying will display my light in the world. That will display Christ in me. I want to explain something to you that, that you may have not really grasped before. It's a very simple thought, and I hope that if you haven't grasped it before, you will understand it as soon as I say it. You and I do not create unity. You and I don't create unity. Christ created unity for us on the cross. There's nothing you can do that will change your unity with the other believers in this room, in this region, in this world. There's nothing that you do to affect unity. You are already unified. The question is whether or not you're going to maintain or keep that unity. 
to make it known, to identify. It's like having a family name. And so my last name is Cypher, but maybe I don't, I don't really like my past, or I don't really want to identify with my family. And so I say, what's your name? Mark Cypher. Right? I don't want people to really know who I am. And yet, when we are part of the body of Christ, we should be proud to say that we are unified. Who are you? I'm Mark. I'm a son of the Most High God. And I'm okay with that. And I want to live a life that shows unity toward that, that doesn't have any embarrassment toward that, that I want to live in the light with that so that I can display that and so that other people can say, I'm part of that body too, and I'm, part, I'm partnering with you. I'm united with you. So this idea of God's love for us, that he gave us salvation through Christ, that we've been reconciled, that we've been given a new life, that he has loved us deeply, he now calls us to this balancing life of love and unity in the body. So when it comes to humility, we've really got to work against the Genesis 3 mentality, don't we? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, what ultimately took control was a sense of pride. What I want, what I desire, what I deserve. And yet here, God is calling us against that idea. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, it says in Romans chapter 12. It goes on to say, think of yourselves with sober judgment. Humbly use the unique gifts that you've been given. Understand who you are and whose you are and live it out. And don't give yourselves this, this drunken understanding of who you are. It says, no, have sober judgment. Be of clear mind and understand what he has done, just as Paul explains in the first three chapters. In Philippians 2, you know this, this famous passage where it says, united with Christ, having the same love of God, being with one mind and spirit, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Looking to the interests of others, have the mindset that represents Christ, the one who humbled himself. And in re return, what was God's response? Jesus humbled himself, and God exalted him in his place of humility. God does the same thing with us. He says, the light is showing to the world. It showed in a place, where did it shine the most brightly in all of history on the cross? Because that was the ultimate place of humility. And he says that for us as well. The light will shine deeply and brightly when we live humble lives. Colossians 3, 12 to 15, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness. And the third word is humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another, forgive one another. And over all these things, put on love. God has chosen you. You are holy and dearly loved, so put on humility. The second part is gentleness. This idea of gentleness, being sensitive to other people around you, valuing others, being less concerned with being right and being more concerned with being right there with people in front of you and saying, it's okay for you to be different than I am. Less concerned with being right and more concerned with the human being right in front of you. Some people are crushed by the physical harm that people do to one another. That's not gentle. Nor is it gentle for us to be crushing people with our words or our strong opinions or our condemnation. He says for us to be gentle. You might say, I'm just not a gentle person. That's just not who I am. I'm rough and tumble. I like to say it how it is. And I appreciate your honesty, but it doesn't represent Christ. You've got to tame that. It's right about now that you have to realize that you are choosing to stand against the will of God when you are not in a gentle frame of mind or spirit. When you think it's okay or you're right to go ahead and be brash with your physical nature or your verbal condemnation or your comments that are just unbridled, that is not being gentle. And it doesn't represent Christ, and it doesn't balance the scale. It does not show the light of Christ. Be gentle. That's the only way the Holy Spirit operates, in gentleness. Amen. Thirdly, patience. <laughs> Can you endure and suffer through the annoyances and difficulties for an extended period of time? 
our ability to endure other people, especially those that are not like us, shows our patience. And it shows the Holy Spirit is moving in us. He's driving us. He's motivating us by the love and power and grace of the Holy Spirit, of the God of the Holy Spirit. Value other people enough to let them make mistakes. Value other people. Be patient with them to let them know that they are ethically able to be mature and go through a process of maturity just like you have and do each day. We need to bear it with one another, not only for a short time, for longer periods of time. Passion, love, this type of endurance that we need to bear with one another in love without ceasing. We need to have this agape love for one another, understanding the difference between the majors and the minors. You know that there are differences between all of us, physically, emotionally, and theologically. But the fact is that something theologically that we differ on are major, and some are, and most are minor. And we need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, maintain this unity, value it, invest in it, care for it, understanding we didn't create it, we keep it. And that unity that, that we have is based on the peacekeeping work of Jesus Christ. He loved us for a long period of time. So my question is then, how is it, if we, if we get our head around humility and, and gentleness and patience and long-suffering or loving for an extended period of time, bearing with one another in love, it then goes on and says, how are we unified? So who do I know if I'm unified with? Who do I know who I'm unified with? Well, here are seven ways to figure it out. And they all start with one. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There is one body of Christ. Did you know that? There is one body of Christ. There are several local churches all around the world, in our region, everywhere, but there is one body. And the unity is within that one body. No matter where I live in this world, there is one body. We can have different denominations. We call ourselves a non-denominational church. It happened that way because we know that people came from every which direction to come and gather together from whatever their experience was before. They came, and some of you are meeting in this room. You've been here for years or you've been here for days. I don't know. But the fact is you've come from lots of different angles around the world, and you've come to this space and to become part of this body. Why? Because you know that as one body in union with Christ, we represent people all around the world who love and are united by the Spirit of Christ. It says, for we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body. Remember, there was this argument about the Jews and the, Cre and the Greeks. They were like, divided, divided, divided. There's no way that those two groups could ever be united. And who united them? Christ. The impossible became possible. And so it is that when we are thinking about people around the world, we go, oh, they're not like me. They just express differently. They're not like us. I ask, I'd ask you today, do you believe that there is one body? And do you believe that there is one Holy Spirit? And do you believe that there is one living hope? There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God above all and through all and in all? All of these seven ones express the reality that there is only one gospel. And that to believe that gospel is to enter into the unity that it creates. It, it was created for you. You express it. You don't make it. All believers share the common calling, this common hope. Christians know only one Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. There's only one faith. That means there's only one gospel. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way that we have salvation and redemption and reconciliation. It's through Jesus. That's it. Amen. That's it. One baptism. This one gets people a little stuck. There's only one baptism. Wait a second. Well, is it infant baptism or is it later baptism? Is it okay? Forget about it. There's one baptism. You know what the one baptism is? Jesus. Did he change your life? Yeah. Right? So whether you were whether you were baptized in a bathtub or a hot tub or a pool or a lake, or you were sprinkled or you were dunked. We express it one way, but I want to tell you this. Were you baptized into Jesus Christ? Some of you may not be with me on that. I don't know, but that, I'm telling you that you either have, you've either been baptized. Because remember, baptism is an outward expression of a what? Inward change. It's already taken place. It's already taken place. It's just a public declaration of that. Has that happened already in your heart? Have you been baptized? I don't know. But if you want to express it publicly, this is the way we do it. 
Let's do it. In Christ, you are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So either you were baptized or you're not. It's just whether you've expressed that publicly. The quote, if people have the same Lord, they believe the same gospel, and experience the same reality of being baptized into Christ, should they not live out this unity? Touching on toes here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the Shema. That's written in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. One God, over all, through all, in all. We are made for relationships with God, with others, with the body of Christ. These positive relationships, shared experiences, shared identity, shared values. The believers, if you're a believer, then you have a shared identity with Christ. If you are a believer, you have shared experiences with Christ and, more, and experiences of Christ. And as believers, we have values that are determined by Christ. And our job to balance the scale is to maintain the balance of these through our humility, through our gentleness, through our patience, through our long-suffering love that bears with one another even in the most difficult of times. That's what promotes unity and community. Now, you might be saying, now, how do I get along with people from that church? How do I get along with people from that church? Which, well, lends me to the idea that your ego is pretty large because you might say that that statement being stated lacks a certain level of humility and gentleness and patience and love. How do I get along with a person from that church? Here's a good reminder. Christians don't have to agree on everything to have unity. We need to live the unity of a common commitment to Jesus Christ. Do they believe in one body? Do they believe in one spirit? Do they believe in one hope? Do they believe in one Lord? Do they believe in one faith? Do they believe in one baptism? Do they believe in one God who is above all and through all and in all? Not all do. But if they do, we have no choice but to drop our guard and maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to look like. But you're going to have to start asking your own self, am I humble when it comes to thinking about that person or that church? Am I gentle? Am I patient? Do I love them no matter what? I don't, want, I don't know if you know this. There will be no denominations in heaven. None. Zero. They're going to say, are you united as part of the body of Christ? I'm not up here preaching a universalist church. I'm not. But I'm saying that there are some people that we don't, we don't have a lot of unity with right now that Jesus is begging for us to have unity with. Because he says, I want those scales to be balanced in a way that the world sees that you love me first. We need to live, to live rationally. We need to live relationally. We need to live ethically. We need to lay down our self-centeredness and be humble. We need to lay down our harsh words and our physical misbehaviors and be gentle. We need to lay down our own timing and agendas and be patient. And we need to lay down our rights and love others where they are at with enduring love. Because you can't live a life that is worthy of the calling that you've received, as Paul describes in the first three chapters, without humility and gentleness and patience and love. Now, I will say that unity does not mean unity at any cost. It's unity in Christ. And it's a daily pursuit. And there are healthy limits to our unity. But if true unity in Christ exists, we must embrace it and celebrate it together. Many local churches, one body in Christ. There, just a final story as we close. Uh, this week, and I don't know if I can find it quickly, um, there was comment about the revival that was taking place um, in the United States right now. And I'm not here to speak details into that, nor would I be the best person to speak into that. And yet, I, I wanted to, um, 
just bear with me as I use technology. There we go, great. I, I received an invitation, and I just want to share it with you. Dear fellow Atlantic Christian leaders, so it was written to me and the other leaders of our church, I'm reaching out to you today along with several other pastors from a variety of churches who serve in the Atlantic region to invite you to a one-day gathering of pastors in Atlantic Canada to go before God in worship, prayer, and petition to see him move in our region in a fresh way. As I'm sure you are keenly aware, we are in a moment all over the world where the things are shifting and many of us are sensing and seeing the Spirit of God beginning to move in special ways. As we see different pockets of revival breaking out, several of us have felt prompted to gather together and cry out to God in, uni in united praise and prayer for a fresh move of his spirit in and through the church in Atlantic Canada. One gathering with the sole purpose of praying in a united voice, in one accord, no denominational or local church agendas or banners, crying out to God for a fresh move of the spirit. Yes. Signed, a pastor. It's on my calendar. I'm planning to go. Because how can, I, how can I reject that invitation when I hear God is speaking to me and talking about being united as one body? There are lots of comments and probably questions coming from this, and I hope there are. And you're welcome to ask me and welcome to ask one another. But whatever you do, do this conversation that you will have with me or with one another with a spirit of humility, a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of patience, and long-suffering love bearing with one another. And I think as we stand united and live as light in the world, we just might see a shift. Amen. Father, I pray today for the United Church, the United Church according to your spirit, that we are united by Christ, that we are united in you, that we are one body in union with Christ, that we can stand and know you and love you and be your representatives and ambassadors here in the world. And I pray that you would work in our hearts to understand whatever strongholds that are there currently, any prejudices that we may have, any discouragement or maybe past references that are playing into current ideas. And may we start afresh, put on your lenses, and see the world through your perspective. Not that we would just accept everything that comes our way, but that we would be filtering according to your spirit, knowledgeable and discerning and wise, to understand what can we do to live more united as your church, the body of Christ. And I pray this together with a spirit of partnership in my heart, O oh Jesus. Amen.